Hello again and welcome to another episode of the Franchise Everything podcast where we talk about everything and anything franchising and surprise today we are in Sydney again and we're at the head office of Couriers Please and are joined by CEO Richard Thame. Richard, thanks for uh, joining us today. Great to be with you. Thank you, mate. Thank you very much for having us here. We've, um, we've been in Melbourne recently with Couriers Please down there with James and the whole team down there and now paying a visit up here. Um, thanks so much for having us. I, uh, I did hear you had a good time with the guys in uh, Melbourne. Did they get you out in a van or did they just tell you what it's like out no, there? No, they didn't. They just um, they, were, they were telling us to be very careful walking around the, <laughs> walking around the warehouse, what, not to touch any conveyor belts, not to touch any goods. <laughs> yeah, look, it's amazing. I mean, um, we've really grown the business over the last 40 years that we've been around in Australia, but safety is something that we take very seriously, um, certainly that was very, that was very clear. the entire business. So, yeah, so that's something we don't make any apologies for. No, no. They got but I the, hope they made you feel welcome nonetheless. They just got in the way of our filming, always telling us to move, weren't they, Jono? Always telling us to move so we didn't get run over. So no, that was that was probably for a good reason, I'd say. Um, no, they were great down there, a really happy bunch of guys and happy whole team down there. So it was great. Oh, it's um, good to hear. Great hospitality. So, but this one's about you. This one, this, this little podcast we're doing right here is about you as a business leader in Couriers Please. So um, I said to you when we were talking off camera, by the description and everything and everything I've heard about you, because we actually, have, I don't know that we've met properly previously, have we? I don't think well, so. I'm sure our paths have crossed. At an FCA so, event or something so. like that. So um, that I reckon you, just by your description, the way people talk about you, could be, possibly be the award for the hardest working guy in franchising, quite possibly, I think. Um, what, what, what's, what comes to mind when you think of that sort of thing? Do you think that's partially true? I mean, do you think you're, you're, you're burning the candle at both ends? Or? Oh, look, you've got me at a particularly busy time of the year. <laughs> I know, yeah, I know, I know. It's, what is it? It's uh, October, middle of October. I mean, I've been in franchising a long time, but Dan, franchising's been very good to me yep. uh, over the years. So I think, you know, we all have an obligation to give back to the to the sector. Uh, it's also been a tough couple of years yeah. in, uh, in franchising as well, has been in the broader economy. But uh, I'm a big believer in the franchise way of doing business. And I think franchise systems are great because they give budding entrepreneurs who otherwise wouldn't necessarily get a chance to be successful in their own business to get up and to do something. And uh, and I think it's uh, there's nothing more rewarding as an executive in a franchise system when you see somebody come into a business, mm. uh, work with the franchisor and become really successful. Uh, yeah, it's in a, such in a platform. Case, it's such a know, launch platform, isn't it? Th- this is our fortieth year of operation here at Couriers Please, uh, and I've had the pleasure of attending a number of our forty-year anniversary celebrations. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was in in Melbourne with mm. one of our franchise partners who's been around for forty years. I was going to say, wasn't there is one that's been for forty years? Isn't yeah, there? And, yeah, and still going strong. <laughs> that's a great. That's a fantastic story. I'd love to talk to him one day. Um, so. If we work back through, I was talking about you being very busy, but it's, I want to go back into your how you've got to Couriers Please. So you, you, your person I describe has got a really seriously strong franchise pedigree. You come from a really diverse set of brands and industries and niches that you've worked in. Can you talk us through some um, the sort of your path to Couriers Please and how you've become the CEO of this right now? What, yeah, what does that sure. Look like? I, I guess like a lot of people did, I, I left, uh, left school, went to university and, and really didn't know what I wanted to do. So you tend to fall into things and and what I find about a lot of people that you meet in franchising is they're not afraid to try new things. Mm. Uh, so for me, it was, it was I, I started life uh, working as an accountant and then found that that wasn't something I necessarily wanted to do. I probably wasn't a very good one. <laughs> how, long, <laughs> so, how long did you do that for? So I did it for a, I did it for a couple of a couple of years uh, and working for working uh, for an accounting firm mm. does give you exposure to quite a few different oh, industries and, and it's great. Different projects so, and things you to understand how to read a balance sheet and a PL mm. and and all of the the things that make a business tick are, are really really important. So so what were you do? What was your actual role in those account the accounting firm? You yeah, were? so I started as a as a junior uh, mm-hmm. in a in a firm that merged with one of the big four firms, mm-hmm. and then decided that that wasn't the way that I wanted to spend the rest of my life. What, so, what was it that triggered that that you didn't so, want to? Was it a particular moment or you thinking, geez, I don't want to do this anymore? I don't think it was one particular thing. No. I think it was just a you know a, a realization that I it was just the vibe that I. That What's I the vibe? came to, yeah. <laughs> and, um, so I, I was looking for something as different as I could possibly find, and that's that's where I ended up at uh, at McDonald's. And I'd always mm. had a fascination with uh, with marketing, and I uh, ended up kind of going to McDonald's in a in an accounting role, and then was given a, a wonderful opportunity mm. to move across into the marketing area. Uh, so, so you leapt from accounting McDonald's to marketing. Yeah, that's okay. right. 
Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, when you do that, the marketing people are always uh, slightly suspicious. Yeah, of I bet. <laughs> Looking at you <laughs> with a while. What's this guy doing so in here? you do kind of feel you've got something to prove how, in that How did you, how did you pull that off? How did you get into, how did you leapfrog from accounting with Maccas to Oh, they were marketing? very generous at the time. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, would that, that happen today? I, I, I think, you know, marketing over the last 20 years has, mm. has certainly become a lot more focused on on the returns, yeah, on the numbers. On and analytics, there is on an data, for sure. component to it. Yeah. And particularly with access to data and, and big data. Um, but I think I, you know, I was I was passionate about making the move, and I wanted to learn. And mm. and I'm a big believer in you know life's journey is just one one big kind of learning Absolutely. experience. Are you are you a very creative? So were you a creative marketer, or were you more the analytical I, side? I'd like it? to I'd like to see myself as a creative marketer, but I'll leave that for other people to judge, Glenn. <laughs> you don't you don't want to throw that out there. <laughs> oh, yeah, but one creative. of the one of the things I really loved about McDonald's is that is that in in marketing at McDonald's and product marketing in particular, you got exposed to the full gambit of the business. Mm. So you you started with a with an idea, and often those ideas came from franchise partners. And the business really kind of, um, uh, I guess, really insisted on the on the the head office and the support office people getting out into the field, um, yep. speaking with franchisees, working with suppliers, to bring an idea to life, to scan the world for the the, the various uh, the various products that have been successful in different markets to see if they could be successfully executed mm. here in Australia as well. So it was yeah, a great experience. Imagine. You got exposure to all elements of the business, and I think it's probably the thing that I enjoyed the the most. That exposure. Yeah, abs- absolutely. Yeah. Were there any particular projects you worked on that? that- that stand out or that were memorable, or yeah. Well, I was I was there back in the days when we used to uh, we used to advertise on television. Yeah, cool. <laughs> I mean, these days it's all done on social media and, fit, and digital. So it's I feel not really, that long I feel ago, really but it feels like a long time. Now, but it feels a long yeah. time ago now. So yeah, working on uh, working on some of those great uh, TV campaigns was a was a real highlight. Mm. Uh, I still remember, yeah, sitting there and going through a thousand buns to try to find the the, right the perfect one, one. The, the perfect one that looked the good. Perfect so, bun. Yeah. Perfect so, bun. The so attributes was, of the perfect uh, yeah, bun. So I was I was by no means kind of. Uh, senior in the creative process, <laughs> so, <laughs> but you were learning and I enjoying. Do, uh, I did do a lot of learning, and uh, yeah. and I did a lot of uh, yeah, I did a lot of bun checking. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a line. Let's move on to the so, next one. So, how long are you at Macca's for? I was there for a couple of years. Yeah, and uh, and then I, I enjoyed the marketing side of things. Um, I felt I'd learned a lot, and I got an opportunity to uh, to go to a company called Greater Union in the uh, mm-hmm. in the film industry. Yep. And that was, um, that was here in Sydney. And that was here in Sydney. Yeah. And uh, and the company was a was a national company. I owned a couple of cinema chains here. Um, and uh, it was a listed a listed business. Owned a hotel business as well as some other businesses. And what I really loved about that was that that was an industry that was going through enormous change because mm-hmm. cinemas were challenged by video coming out. Yeah. At the, at and what the time. year was this? Um, and that was in the 90s. Okay. So uh, yeah, all of a sudden uh, there was a lot of pressure under uh, yeah. on cinema chains. Little did they, little so, did they know what you, was coming. How do you compete with these things? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's the really that's the really interesting thing. At the time they were trying to compete with video yeah. and you had the rise of the, the video stores. Wow, I, you know, I can't remember the last time I, I saw a video store, let alone. Yeah, uh, I know. Went into I don't one. think they, I think the last block, blockbuster closed the other day. I think yeah, I saw well, a story and on it. yeah, and streaming kind mm. of, you know, really hadn't hadn't been invented mm. at that stage. So at that stage, it was it was working with a fantastic group of creative people, um, working with the film distributors as well to to promote the film and get people into cinemas, but also mm. reinventing the experience, so making it a great experience for consumers. And the thing there I learnt was that in tough economic times, people do do things like go to the movies because yep. it's a great escape for them. Yeah, it's their outing. It's the one yeah. that they, they do look forward to. And I was there during an enormous period of, of growth for the business as well. They were investing in mega screens, digital sound, mm. these huge stadium complexes, and working with the likes of Westfield and some of the other big shopping centre providers to create these entertainment and leisure precincts. And that was to really try to future-proof the model. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, when you look, when I look back at it now, shopping centres really needed to future-proof their model as well. Mm. So mm. so the challenges were more immediate in the cinema industry, but those same challenges around foot traffic have now been borne out, I guess, for shopping centres and yeah, strip sure. malls and so forth more generally. Yeah, so you stayed there for a couple of years and you're, you're – so that was out of the franchising space, though, wasn't it? So you, you yeah. So out that of it. was that was completely out of the out of the franchising mm. space. And I guess it was um, my hunger at that stage. I'd moved into to marketing to to really broaden my experience there yeah. across other other businesses. But I but I did end up uh, I did end up back in uh, back in franchising. Mm. Uh, I went to work for a thrifty car rental. Um, so in that at that stage. 
Um, I found that to be an incredibly low margin uh, competitive industry. Yeah, I bet. Uh, when you go to an airport, you've got all of the different yep. car rental operators. Mm-hmm. I still remember people paying more to rent a lawnmower than they did to rent a car. So, God, so it doesn't feel like uh, that now. <laughs> so again, yeah, and and and, and yeah, you know, so it's got more expensive. And it's and it's really interesting now when you look at kind of I, I rented a car last week mm. uh, in uh, in Adelaide and. Um, and it's it's an electric car now, and the whole proposition's changed again. Yeah, when you when you look back in positions and roles in businesses that you've previously been in, do you keep an eye on how those businesses run um, I, now? And I like don't keep... think you can help doing that. I mm. like to think I'm a loyal a loyal person, but uh, I'm so do you rent thrifty? I'm a curious. Person. <laughs> do you rent thrifty? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. I do whenever I whenever I can. When you can, yeah, yeah. whenever I can. And yeah. I, and I the other thing that I learned is that that when you're in those industries that can easily be commoditized. Mm. You've really got to find a way to create a point of difference, and and I think the point of difference to your point about do I use those brands? Mm. The point of difference really is how do you provide a better customer experience? How do you make yeah. it a more intimate experience? How do you make it better so that when you know if you're a regular customer and you turn up at the counter that you are recognised mm. and that it's a more seamless experience? I don't know about you when you get off a plane if you've been up at three or four in the morning um, to come and do one of these interviews. Sounds you, very familiar. <laughs> you don't want to stand at a car rental no, counter for, and, and for th- thirty minutes. So. And I think that whole industry has a real challenge with that because it's, I mean, we rent everywhere, obviously, and I see that every single time I go. There's um, no recognition whatsoever, depending on no matter how many times you rent with someone. The, one of the really interesting statistics I remember from that industry was that when I joined, um, you know, we developed a website. And, mm. and in those days, unveiling a new company website, there was, was some razzle, yeah. razzle dazzle associated with it and it was a big deal. These days, of course, it's just the website's continually yeah, updated. Evolving. Yeah. But I guess the significant point there is that about, Four or five percent of our transactions then with customers, our uh, bookings were done online. Mm. Nowadays, I'd I'd think it would be you know ninety five percent. Have to be done, surely done there wouldn't, online. There wouldn't so. be many walking up at the desk just saying, "Can I rent a car?" Would there? Yeah, and it was interesting being in that industry at that time when that change was starting to happen mm. and to be part of that. And and that led me to another travel industry business called called Sabre, which was an old um, GDS business or Global Distribution System. Uh, this was a company that was spun out of American Airlines mm-hmm. and handled millions still today millions and millions of travel bookings for, mm. for customers so booking booking airfares and printing tickets and so forth um, and ironically in in that business you know I was on the supplier side so I was selling and supporting technology platforms for travel agency groups most of whom were independently owned or part of a franchise network yeah. in in those days so you so still I, had that franchise connection so there. I got to see yeah I, I got to see what it was what it was like on on the other side working and how do you, how is a how is a supplier to the franchise industry can you help make these people mm. successful yeah and the way that franchise systems buy things is very different to corporates corporates have yep. normally a, a, a highly govern process and tendering process and so forth and it's very much based around price. When you're selling to a franchise group, it's often based around the service and the support that you as a supplier can help provide that franchise network and how you can help those franchisees grow. Absolutely and timing. For a lot of those things is timing and all those things plus timing I've found is often is as equally as critical, yeah. um, right, right, right place, right time. So I've been to a lot of franchise conferences mm. over the years here and overseas. Yeah, I bet, I bet. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's probably fair to say it can be a lot more fun sometimes on the supplier side than it is being the one on stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it can be. You just sit back and relax and listen and, so, ne- and yeah, network and connect. Yeah. And I think that whole concept of, of networking is mm. something that I is something that I learnt through those through those roles, yeah, and particularly bet. being on the being on the supplier side and being that trusted source of source of advice was really really important particularly when people have have got their house on the line or have borrowed a significant amount of money mm. to to get into a business then uh then you, you really do just realize how much they're relying on some of those strategic partnerships and, and it doesn't change when when you're a franchisor obviously it's exactly the same isn't it what they've got on the line yeah that's that's ex- that's exactly right and and these days um you know we've we've seen a lot of change to a, a lot of legislation that's affecting franchise businesses um mm. whether it's workplace health and safety which is which is really important but all of these things come with a come with a huge cost yeah. as well so you that was the the travel industry there and i know because I know your little bit of your background when we chatted before, you started to drift right back into franchise operational 
type of functions and roles. So w- what was there to bring us back around to where you're at now? Yeah, I did. Uh, I, this is, uh, Cruise Please is certainly not my first foray into the parcel and logistics business. Mm. Um, I ended up working for a, uh, for a company called Fastway at the time. And um, the interesting thing about that was that a lot of the things that I saw happening in the in the travel industry years years before I could see I could see happening in the um, in the logistics industry people say well what's the what on earth yeah, can what's the, the correlation be? and yeah. it's it's really really simple that both can easily be commoditized so if you look at the travel industry mm-hmm. saw people go from booking through a travel agent to through technology being able to book directly with an airline and you saw airlines giving customers the best deals if they if they did that yep. directly it forced the travel agency to become I guess more of a consultant and to find different ways to to add value what what I identified um, when I joined the the fastway business was that that parcel delivery in Australia and courier companies as distinct from postal businesses used to be really reserved for business to business transactions mm. so not business to consumer so yeah, as, I was a, a, as a consumer you generally wouldn't go no, it, was, it was a, a real mystery to when go I was that. a kid when I was a kid growing up it was only incredibly wealthy people that mm. would have had things delivered to them by a yeah, courier service yeah, I'll get everything a courier else, to you everything yeah. else went through the through the mail absolutely through the mail network and if it was above a certain size, often you'd have to go to a post office and yep. pick it up. And people just accepted that was the way of doing business. When, when, I, um, when I joined the Fastway business, I remember talking with the team about this, this concept of online retail and how people were, what year was this? were going was to this? sell. This was back in 2008. Yep. So in that stage, I'd seen it in, I'd seen the car rental business move dramatically online. I'd mm. seen the travel industry go online. So to me, it was no coincidence that we we're going to see this Profound change and permanent change in the way that the way that people shopped. We we saw this explosion in broadband and access to the mm-hmm. internet. So all mm-hmm. of a sudden, it just became easier to shop online. I guess one of the most exciting things for me at that time was that we were working with a number of different customers. Some customers in the wine industry. One customer in particular comes to mind, Naked Wines, and you may have yep. seen their promotional uh, activity now. I remember working with them when they when they were a startup business. They were funding winemakers who wouldn't be able to get a vintage to market normally and uh, through a, essentially a, a crowdfunding program, mm-hmm. working with them when they were sending less than 5,000 cases a year. And and, uh, and and I think when I left that business, they were sending well over 500,000. So wow. just an amazing success story. Now, the really interesting thing at the time was we didn't know anything about online retail as a, as a management team, but what we learned was or what we identified was that we just needed to say one day ahead of everybody else because nobody else in logistics knew anything about online retail either. So no one was on top of it even at that time? Well, and the interesting thing about logistics mm-hmm. at, at that stage was that logistics businesses were so used to doing things the same way. They were used to sending, picking up a box from one business and sending it to, an, to yeah, another one. And it was sort of our way or that's the only way. Well, yeah, very much. Mm. And so as a customer, you had to fit into that, yep, that Absolutely. I, I recall it. Businesses were always open every day. There was somebody mm. at the counter. It was easy to get a signature. You didn't have to deal with people not being home. Generally, the addresses were all, all right. Yep. So it it was a pretty simple way of doing business. Now, obviously, e disrupted that in some positive and some negative ways as well, mm. made it a little more challenging. And all of a sudden, you were dealing with millions of consumers that really didn't understand how logistics had traditionally worked. Yeah, and frankly, so, so they weren't frankly, happy to wanted play. a better experience. Yeah, they weren't happy to play by those rules. <laughs> so they yeah. weren't happy to play play by the rules. So we had yeah. to work out. What so the so new how long did it take you to get your head around that? And did you, I imagine that's not a fast change. You couldn't do that. Took us so a couple quickly. of years. Yeah. Took us a couple of couple of years to do that. And and I guess the the beauty of the franchise model in logistics, and and I see it here at Careers Please, is our franchise partners are really passionate about maintaining their own customer relationships. Mm. And I think that's the one thing that differentiates us from a postal network. Work. We're not we're not delivery couriers. Mm. We're couriers. We're courier franchisees. Yeah, and our franchise partners customers have that relationship with our own customers. And what customers mm. tell us they like about the system is that it's the same person picking up and delivering in the same territory every day. So that makes them more efficient. Uh, they really understand their their customers, mm. both their pickup and their and their delivery and customers. It's interesting, and I said to you about in the pre-brief we did before this is when we spoke to a whole bunch of Couriers Please franchise owners last week in some stories we did with them. Um, pretty much when I asked them what they love about doing what they do, um, it was the customers. Driving, they love being out and about and freedom and everything, going doing their own thing, and customers. Yeah, if you really want an office office kind of 
role or a, or a business where you're based in an office the whole time is probably not for you. No, no, <laughs> I mean, not. It's, so <laughs> it is it is very much being being out on the road, and it's mm. hard work. There's no there's no yeah. doubt about that. We don't hide away from that, yep. and it's not it's not for everybody. Well, that, um, and you say that it reminds me that a number of them also said they love it because it keeps them fit, yep. keeps them active, keeps them fit. So they were getting dual benefit. One of them said that they were. Um, Keeping fit while earning money at the same time. Yeah, no question. So that well, that was an older gentleman. Um, he thought that was a really key attribute for him. And I think the other the other thing I've observed over the last twenty odd years in franchising is that it's expensive for people to get into. There are lots of great franchise systems out there, mm. but many of them have a really high entry cost. Yeah, and it's getting harder and harder to to be able to borrow those funds if you don't have them from a bank or financial institution. Yeah. What I like about uh, the some of the franchise businesses that I've been fortunate enough to work with is that they're entry-level franchises, they're mobile franchises. There's not a huge capital investment, so it's easy to get in. Mm. If I look at the enormous diversity that we have in the demographic mix that makes up Careers Please, we've got people from more than 40 different nationalities and backgrounds all coming and working together. So this has been over many years an opportunity for people to come to Australia to get into their own business and then to either sell that business, develop that business, buy an additional territory mm. and, and, and then use that as a springboard to start their business career here in Australia or alternatively to, to buy a house, to get a deposit for a house. Mm. And, and that's, that's you know, something that I'm really oh, it's inspiring. It's, it's inspiring. Yeah. And I, I don't think I mentioned to you, we um, met one gentleman, we did a podcast last week with Pappy you know, from um, Collingwood, Chris yes. Please Collingwood. Yeah. Well, he'd be um, happy with the grand final result this year. I obviously. would be very happy so. with it. He was still smiling, but um, refugee camp for nine years yep. and into into Australia. Um, he's happy. Couldn't be happier. Um, qualified civil engineer, didn't want to do that, didn't want to be in an office, didn't want to do that and loves doing what he does. I'm Absolutely constantly loves amazed by by the diverse backgrounds mm, that people, so I was, I was people come from. And we saw that back in when I entered the logistics business in franchising in 2008. That was – and we, we've kind of – forgotten it, I guess, to some degree with COVID and all mm. of the other things that have happened in the last couple of years. But that was what we now refer to as the GFC. Yeah. And and that was a time that was was kind of a boom time for franchising in the sense that it's different to today because we've got tough economic times today, but we've got low unemployment. Yeah. At that stage, people were really worried about losing their job. And whenever you have those economic times, you do see a spike in interest mm. in, in franchising. There's, there's no doubt about it. Absolutely. Now, so we've already jumped ahead on careers, please. You had other roles prior after um, fast rate, didn't you, in franchising? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so a after couple, I, couple of different ones. After I left fast, well, Fastway became Aramax. The, yes. the company was sold. I had yep. the good fortune to work with the new owners for a number of years. How long were you there for? Uh, so I was there for ten years. Ten years, in, okay. In total, significant experience there. So it was a it was a, a long time, great journey, mm. and uh, and then I, I wanted to do something different as well, and I I had the the great. Um, privilege and opportunity to go and work for one of Australia's oldest companies um, and another franchise business in Snap Franchising. Mm -hmm. So Snap has been around for more than 120 years, um, a print business, obviously facing the the challenge of, of structural you, you decline. You keep stumbling in into industry. areas with us. So, that yeah, so you see a pattern here, <laughs> yeah, I, do, I, do. I guess, this, this pattern of I don't know if it's deliberate or not. Change and I don't know. I've got to sit down and have a good think about that one day. <laughs> 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 um, and, but, yeah, I, I was, I guess, attracted to that business because I was fascinated by a company that had been around for, for 120 years and stood the test of time, yet was facing this enormous structural challenge that, Arguably, they couldn't they couldn't control. Yep. Clearly, the yeah, world is becoming of their control. more more yeah. digital. Clearly, people are, are are printing less on less on paper. Um, but having a having a really well established network of franchise partners that know what they're doing, um, mm. and a great brand name that's uh, well known and well regarded in the market as well. Mm. So that was a that was a great opportunity, and uh, and I joined the business a couple of months before COVID, and uh, was was out visiting franchise partners at the time. And one question that I would I would frequently get asked, um, as new CEOs to a mm. business often do, is, well, what's the what are your observations and what are you seeing? And one of the standout things to me there was that although the business had been around a long time, had a very loyal and established customer base, there was there was very little online presence. So you, you couldn't order your order your printing mm. online. And it was a real challenge at the time for franchise partners who were used to providing a great service, not selling on price um, because they didn't need to. Their quality was so much better than a lot of the other online printers. But to work out how they could maintain those relationships, those those margins without 
missing out on what was going to be this big online opportunity. So in some yeah. ways, COVID really sped up the changes that I think were probably going to be inevitable changes in the print industry. Yep. We spent a lot of that time during COVID working with franchise partners. Everybody had more time on their hands. Some of our our, our locations were down 80% plus. Yeah, I can imagine. We were spending yeah, more time. As businesses shut down and close. And, and, and particularly in the CBDs, as, yeah. you can, as you can imagine. Many of those would have, would have you know, taken a lot longer to recover as well. Mm. But we were spending more time printing uh, labels for sanitizer bottles. I bet you were. And bet you, yeah. uh, cafes and, and restaurants and mm. uh, train stations and so forth. So, so an in, a time of incredible pressure. But what I'm most proud of, I think, about that time is just the way the network came together. Yeah and continued to operate and provided an essential service around the around the country. Mm. So, and I think that's – I always thought about that period and I, people have a go at me sometimes for mentioning COVID, but the fact is it was, it was quite a landmark, obviously, time in many businesses and it's still quite recent. Um, I thought it was a time that franchising really shined because – um, being a business owner on your own, running my own business as I do, um, you know, in a franchise network with someone you can e- either other franchise owners or field support or franchise or head office that you could bounce things off. Because remember, th- so many things were changing and going on at that time to keep up with every press conference for changes. So I think that communication point of that sounding board, shoulder to lean on, I think was absolutely critical for many people. I think it was an incredibly confusing time. It I was. mean, you're right, we quickly forget the 11 a.m. Um, press conference, oh, no. so the ratings would have been huge. <laughs> <laughs> no, every day. We were doing a lot of email was, marketing and you think, no, we're not sending one today. There's been a press co- big press conference. And and, a, yeah. and it was, I think, the you know, having been part of an organisation and, uh, and in our case part of the Franchise Council of Australia as well, who mm. I thought did a terrific job of synthesising a yeah, huge I volume of information. And the other challenge was that most franchise systems are national businesses, mm. yet there were so many different so many state, state jurisdictions, was jurisdictions to deal with. Yeah, and I think that was a little crazy in, yeah. in hindsight. But again, you know, our state leaders were dealing with their first pandemic as yeah, well. So, yeah, true. so I certainly don't want to be critical, but I but I think the being part of a network meant that you had that built-in sounding board, as you yep. described. So you, you're in business um, – for yourself, but not by yourself. Which is the common which phrase, is the old kind of yeah, phrase that but we it was often talk was about. So true, in, wasn't you know, it? it was a throwaway line in franchising sometimes, but mm. it was never a chore time. Yeah, I agree. so I think there was there was enormous enormous value there, and I think just being able to pick up the phone. I mean, we talk about the residual mental health effects of mm. COVID. I, I think just being able to pick up the phone to someone in your own network who was going sure. through a similar a similar thing. And for us, our ultimate BCP, our backup plan during COVID was to rely on fellow fellow franchise partners. Mm. So it, I, I think COVID was so big that you, you couldn't just rely on the support office to come in and help help run the yeah, location. Absolutely. You really had to work as a as a network together. Absolutely. So the transition to Couriers, please. What, what was your thinking about that? Um, yeah, so it wasn't when, when out of we... some desperation to come back into the parcel industry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I did what it, what many of us um, many of us have have done over the years is is go back to something that that we know where we feel that we can use the benefit of our experience mm. to to drive change. Um, I, I saw that the that change that had taken many many years as online retail had grown and people became more familiar with with careers was turbocharged during yep. during covid um, i felt that careers please was primed to take advantage of that opportunity over the next couple of years because we have a very a very strong um, owner um, and are well supported by Singapore Post who really want to invest in this market here in Australia but they want to understand um, the market and what they can do to create I guess a not only a competitive well-run business but where we can provide a service that's slightly different. What I mean by that is that we're much smaller than, than Australia Post. Australia Post have a fantastic network and, and mm. do a great job. But we're, we're a more agile business. Um, we want to pick our winners. We want to identify businesses that we think are going to be successful in the future and we want to grow with them. Mm. And, uh, and our, you know, we want to set up opportunities for franchise partners, not only in the, in the locations that we're in today, but we want to increase our footprint uh, around Australia. We think there's a huge opportunity in some of the bigger regional centres as well. Yeah, so is your so is one of the key roles in from a national office perspective and from your leadership team is identifying and securing key retail contracts of large retail contracts for yeah, your franchise partners ab- to generate more revenue. So so the so the the large retail contracts and we deal with with most of the top ten uh, retailers at the moment. But it's to it's to not only go and secure those those agreements, but it's also to provide the systems and the tools for franchise partners to go and 
find their own customers and mm. work with those mm. customers. But certainly that base load, if you like, is coming nowadays from the from the larger retailers. Yeah. So it's always trying to get that balance right between uh, the number of pickups that you need to do and the number of mm. deliveries that you need to do. It'll never be it'll never be perfect. Mm. And um, and the the one thing that is changing, whether we like it or not, is that we're we're going to continue to see growth in business to consumer deliveries in residential deliveries. Yep. The other thing that we're seeing is that there are there are a lot of there are a lot of um, uh, there were some positives that actually came out of came out of COVID. Nowadays, most people are happy to have something left at their doorstep. Yeah, they don't want to sit, on, sit at home and, and wait to. The wait parcel, to the to parcel sign, locker thing. I thought the parcel locker it. thing would take off and everyone would have one by now or something. Well, it's interesting. We certainly haven't seen the growth in things like parcel lockers, but no. we have in in um, Pudo points, pick up and drop off, um, yeah. drop off points. My first, my first non face to face with the person pick up from um, uh, the mail centre the other day was straight into a uh, parcel locker. Yeah, That's so the first we, time I've done it. So we deal with a network called Hubbed, um, mm-hmm. which have access to more than two thousand locations around Australia, and they're yep. often small businesses, which is which is also what we like about it. But they might be news agents or service stations or dry cleaners or chemists. Yep. Where you can go and, as a customer, a receiver, you can go and pick up your parcel. And what we've tried to do is looked at all the pain points and the things that people typically complain You're talking about. about. The dreaded go to the depot to pick something up. Nobody those ones. To go to a depot. No one wants to go to a depot. Nobody really <laughs> wants to go to a post office either mm. because they're not typically not open long hours. Yeah. It's often difficult. to Park. Stay in a queue often so as you've well. You've got to stand yeah. in a queue at times. So what we've what we've tried to do is work with Hub to create a network um, using their infrastructure of locations where it is safe and secure. They're open long hours. It's easy to park. All those addressing all yep. of those pain points for people. Excellent. And certainly there's a locker there's a locker component to that, but I don't think lockers are the are the be all and end all solution either for customers. No. The the other key thing that we're finding is that we've got a lot of people now telling us that they're going back to work. It might be two or three days a week, might be five days a week. So the concept of well, just tell me they're wanting a day definite delivery. So they're not necessarily saying, well, it has to be delivered tomorrow. Mm. Saying, well, hey, I'm I'm Just at home on day. Wednesday, so if I can pick a Wednesday, yeah, and you've got the technology to let me know that it's on the way on a Wednesday, then that's great. Because the other thing that we have is this enormous database of information about our customers. I bet. And what we're wanting to do is work with our senders and receivers to work out how we harness that in, protect the privacy of of all of our receivers, obviously, but pick up on some of those trends. So mm-hmm. we've tried to deliver it to you for the last three Mondays, uh, and we're going to try to do it again today. And you so haven't been home, home for the previous yeah. three. You're probably not going to be home today. Mm. Then, kind of definition of insanity so is, is to it, do it again. So is that an AI thing? Looking so there's yeah there's people use fancy terms like mm. like AI. I I I I tend to use it as I, I mean I hate the word artificial intelligence. I, yeah. I think we want to use some of the some of the real in real in that's not as catchy though to say real information that we've got. <laughs> I know, isn't it? Everyone likes everyone so, so everyone now has got an AI genera AI driven technology. Is in their there business. is there yeah. is there room in our industry for machine learning and mm. will technology drive that? Yeah, absolutely no question. And it's I mean arguably we will invest more money in technology than we will in in trucks and vans yeah, in the yeah, next couple imagine. of years. The other thing is sustainability. I mean, people are looking for more sustainable options. Mm. So whether that's working with our customers to get more eco-friendly packaging, biodegradable packaging, or or simply to say, don't send a small item in a big box. <laughs> that, that, that is disappointing me to do that. When I is, get uh, stuff on yeah. Amazon Prime or whatever and it, something like that and it comes in a box like that, I'm like, yeah, what do they got to do that for? Don't, what don't a waste. Don't fill it with loads of packaging or yeah. crap that doesn't disintegrate. That doesn't help anyone. Yeah. So, so we're very focused on, I guess, the practical things that we can be doing from a sustainability point of view. Mm. So recycling is very big for us. All of our new facilities, and we're going into two huge new ones in the next in the next twelve months. We'll have full solar on them as well. Mm-hmm. We know that we know that vehicles will make the transition um, from petrol and diesel a- a- across to electric yep. over a period of time, but it won't happen quickly. We know it's need super more expensive. Yeah, more, you need more range reach, to yeah, get more access reach to them. And the other thing that's really burning fossil fuels, obviously, is is line haul those line haul mm. trucks that are that are running overnight every night as well. So, so we're very conscious of those things, and certainly we're working closely with our counterparts in Singapore, who are very advanced on this. Yeah. Have already got hundreds of electric vehicles servicing uh, servicing their customer base there. So it's it's I guess the exciting thing about being part of a bigger group now is that we can work together and take some of those learnings. You can drive as well. some change in that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want to touch on your FCA stuff because you're a, you're very passionate about your involvement with the FCA. So you're the New South Wales State Chapter Committee President. Yes. Correct. And also on the board of the FCA. Yes. Correct. Yep. So tell me 
wh- why that's so important to you? Because obviously you put a lot of time into that and you're, you're relatively time poor because it was very difficult to get an appointment with you to do this podcast. Yeah, yeah um, no, I'm sorry about that. That's so, all right, yeah. that's all right. No, you're just, they, everyone I talk to say he's really busy. I go, I oh, know, so we got it. Yeah, look, I, I, I think everyone in franchising is um, busy. Of course. No one's course. busier than our yeah. franchise, but franchisees, oh, believe yes, me. Sure, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, but no, I am passionate about um, about franchising as a as an industry and a way of doing business. Mm. I think it's important that that um, franchisees and franchisors come together. Um, what I like about the franchise council is that we want to take a, a working to take a balanced view of the of the industry to drive that better collaboration between franchisee and franchisor. I think franchise education is really important. I know over the last twenty years, the number of people that I've worked. F- Worked with that have that have struggled to make that that conversion from working in a traditional corporate environment to working in a franchise business. So I think education is a really yeah, important role that the FCA can can play there. And and when I look at the number of inquiries and the and the amount of compliance now, and that's all important to have a much stronger franchise sector. That I think the FCA can play a really valuable role there, working with with franchisors and franchisees as yeah. well. I, I love the stuff coming out of the FCA at the moment, which is particularly. And a lot of it, you know, as we see things, initiatives roll through is the language around um, it seems to have previously for some period been very much a franchisor-focused um, uh, council. There's a lot of franchisee-focused initiatives and everything have been coming through over the last couple of years, I think, oh, which is really exciting. And, and, having, and having fantastic franchisees on the board yep. certainly certainly helps. Yeah. Uh, and I was in, in Canberra recently with a, uh, a delegation organised oh, by, the, by the FCA and, and it was great to have franchisees and franchisors at, at the table mm. uh, discussing challenges. It's, Im- it's important that we have a level of regulation um, in our industry, but it's also important that we don't over-regulate and that we're mindful of some of the unintended consequences that, that mm. can occur from that. But I, but I think, you know, I'd certainly defer to uh, to, to Matthew, our, our CEO at the, uh, at the FCA, on to speak on the FCA's behalf on those things. But certainly, as a as a as a franchisor and a, and a and a member of the franchising community, I think there's huge value in the networking events that the FCA creates, mm-hmm. um, and those forums. And that's how I learnt about franchising. You learn more at the at the coffee break or the, the end of a session or the bar or the ability to grab someone's email address and follow them up. And as you've been to more and more of those things, um, like is often the case in life, you feel more comfortable absolutely. to reach out to those people and, and have a conversation. But yeah, certainly absolutely. if there are barriers between franchisees and franchisors, they're the things that we need to break down to have mm. that that constructive that constructive dialogue. And one of the, I guess, most important things I've learned in in franchising is that if your franchisees are doing well, then you will do well as a as a as a yeah, franchisor. It's a given, isn't it? Um, so when I was, but it said at the start that I think you might be one of the busiest guys around and I was, I was I, hear me out on why. Um, now I was told about you and we had a little pre, pre-brief, your, your family life, your, your family life is you've got a significant gap. You've got young children and much older children with your workload and the time and everything you're putting. How, how does all that work? Tell me yeah, about so your, your family life. I've got a reasonable take on generational change. I bet you do. I bet you do. <laughs> no, you, you, how things have you've changed. got so much intel. You've got so <laughs> yeah. much intel going on. I've got on. some views on it <laughs> yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, so I've got two. I've got uh, four boys. I'm one of four boys and I've got four boys myself. The mm. uh, difference for me is the gap, as you've identified, yeah. between them. Because so. when I heard it, I went, oh. Oh, well, so yeah, so uh, so um, Harry and Ollie, my my oldest, are, are, are twenty two and uh, and twenty. Yeah. So they're you know right out into the world, operating the- under their own uh, steam to yeah. some degree, yes. <laughs> <laughs> with, with some in, with some input yeah. and assistance, some input yeah. uh, as as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, and Lockie and Xavier, my uh, six year old and three year old. Are uh, yeah, are at uh, at school now and at uh, and daycare. daycare. So you're doing the daycare. So, around, it's yeah, so I'm kind of <laughs> straddling the the work, school, daycare, the whole the whole thing. I, when, when I was told that, so. when you told me the ages, I thought, oh, because I've got an eleven. 14 and 17 year old. Oh my gosh, I couldn't imagine. So you've got an inkling of, of what it's like. But yeah, I'm variously described by people as the the father, the grandfather, or some people probably say nothing because they're not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, when you go so into I don't know if that's yeah, a reflection imagine. of how I've aged or yeah. yes, child parent interviews yeah. and stuff like that. I can imagine. Yeah, so it's always interesting. Like, what's you've got going to, on here? You've got to clarify, clarify your role mm. before you yeah attend yeah, the yeah, interview. Yeah, <laughs> so to save any uncomfortable moments for everyone concerned. But I will tell you what, I do notice is mm. that um, you know my my older boys are quite uh, quite 
and quite sporty. They they still play in the same soccer team now that they did when they were in under five, under six, mm. and um and and I see that my uh, my younger two are as well. But just the digital technology and the influence that has on people's lives. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I can't can't go far in the car without um without internet without but, my three year old without without a, a crisis. A bit of a <laughs> <laughs> without a crisis. <laughs> without a cri- crisis gotta, is a good way of putting it. Yeah. I know it's a crisis. <laughs> you got to make sure you got that battery pack, that backup battery power every now and again. You know, make so sure it's it charged. Does, it does worry me to some extent. Mm. You know, I, I see how quickly they learn and I think that's mm. awesome and that's fantastic. Um, but it does it does also kind of worry Same. me the amount yeah. of screen time on the other the hand. Attention, yeah. The attention issue is yeah. a bit of a problem, isn't it? Yeah, and the stimulation But issue. they do keep you on your, keep you on your toes. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's no absolutely. Doubt about it. <laughs> absolutely. So uh, as we wrap up, so – where, what's the what's the future that you see for yourself and your role in couriers, please? Here, what's um give a crystal ball for the next two, three, four, five years? Think, what, what are you saying? Yeah, my role I think is now to identify opportunities, um, to identify some of the gaps maybe that we've got in the business and how we can improve that relationship between franchisor and franchisee. Um, to certainly work with our customers to work out how we can provide and be that more innovative, agile business. That, that really, really make sure that we that. can go. I mean, yeah. we're big enough to get the job done. We've got a great infrastructure, but making sure that we don't copy the postal networks around the world, that we do provide that that real point of difference and how we embrace technology. So we've got you know three really simple pillars in this business. One is to grow and scale the business. It, we absolutely have an aggressive growth agenda. Uh, over the last quarter, we're up 30% on, on last year. So that's, you know, in terms of mm. the number of parcels that people are sending through our system. So that's that's extraordinary growth. The 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 centerpiece, the second pillar or the centerpiece of our strategy is to is to be more franchise focused. Yep. Um, to, you know, have a high functioning franchise advisory council to take that input and give our franchise partners a say in the way that we go forward as a business and the way that we structure our business. And and the third is to really look at the digital future of this business and in and invest in the right the right technologies that that support our growth and provide that connectivity with with customers, and um and then leverage and work with constructively with the other Singapore Post uh, businesses here in Australia where we have the opportunity I think to be a considerable player in the marketplace here to be a little different and to harness most importantly the entrepreneurship of our owner operators. Um, so that we grow in a really constructive way. Excellent. I've, so I've seen it firsthand in chatting to a bunch of them. So um, great. Excellent, Richard. Thanks so much for joining us on the Franchise Everything podcast. Thank you very much. It was great Excellent. to be here. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, and that's it for this episode of the Franchise Everything podcast. Please review, like, subscribe, do all that stuff that we ask you to do every time. Leave comments. We love hearing from you. And we'll catch you again in the next one soon. Bye.